how um, that happened, but it did. <laughs> fair, fair. Here we are, continue. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our latest Understanding Health talk. Um, today's talk is entitled Understanding Common Skin Conditions, um, and thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, my name is James Donald. I'm the Communications Lead for University Hospitals Dorset, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all today. Um, you may have heard um, about this event from the members newsletter. Um, and if you're not already a member, I highly recommend you join. So please do join us as a member. You'll receive loads of monthly updates um, and magazines and information, etc., about our exciting transformation plans and all that we're doing at the Trust um, as we move forwards with our ambitious plans. Um, and you'll also be kept up to date with events like this today. Um, so we'll be sending you details like that. Um, and also um, to encourage you, if at all possible, next Wednesday we're holding our board meeting and we're doing this online as well so that members of the public can join in and listen to our board and see what we're up to at the Trust and also our sort of plans for the future um, for coping with the very difficult winter ahead of us. So please do, if you can, join us at our board meeting next Wednesday um, in the afternoon from about 1.15 p.m. Details will be on our website. Um, this event will be recorded um, so you, you can watch it again at your leisure um, and it will join our sort of growing list of, of library of understanding health talks and um, some really good topics on there. So I do encourage you all to please have a look at that. Um, also, um, there will be an opportunity to post questions. Um, there's a Q&A bar. Um, please do post any questions. Um, please don't make too personal. Please do remember this is this is a general public conversation um, and it's not a private consultation with Dr. Pearson. Um, it's now my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Pearson um, to take over and to give us his Understanding Health talk on understanding common skin conditions. Thank you very much, Dr. Pearson. Thanks, James. Um, so, yeah, it's nice nice to be asked. I, I, I've been working here now um, since 2005, so um, I, and I had have have been in a couple of times onto these. So, so nice to be asked. I suppose quite important that Brazil are playing a bit later on. So um, that's quite good news that we're not got too many people disappearing off for the World Cup football. Okay, so um, hoping that I've got control that can allow me to just push through the slides. OK, uh, so I suppose first thinking about the skin is actually, you know, what does it do for you? What, 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 what you know, what's it all about? And um, really important to think about it as the largest organ of the human body uh, and being a living barrier. So it, a, a turning over set of cells that look after us and keep all the good stuff in um, and keep the bad stuff out and cope with the bad stuff that's coming at us. Um, but there are lots of other bits to it, of course, as well. So, so you can see from the diagram, there are you, you've got your blood vessels, you've got your sebaceous glands, you've got your hair, a uh, whole range of other things, which actually just puts us together as our external to to the world. So, so an important point, while it's doing some uh, homeostatic jobs like temperature regulation, um, it also looks after what you look like and your and your mirror to the world. So an imp important point about your skin doing good stuff for you. So, so it's just a little slow. So I asked the question about what what do we do to it, uh, and having a little bit of difficulty with the controls, but that's what that's what I'm after, my, my, my arrows, thank you, that's good. Okay, so I suppose the first comment I make is we just take it for granted, aren't we? Don't look, look like lots of other organs of the body, we just think, okay, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it and uh, we probably uh, start washing ourselves at an early stage in life and uh, obviously you've got to deal with all the stuff that goes on. Um, I think I might keep my arrow and try and hope that it stays in that one box and keeps doing the same thing. Um, so we take it for granted. Um, but actually, of course, we probably the fact that we have to wash our skin and do things. It actually may be part of the, some of the problems that I'm going to talk about a little bit, that the, the sort of over effect of, of those of those things that go onto the skin. Um, we cover it and we cover it with lots and lots of different things. And uh, uh, actually, to a certain extent, we might cover it and turn our skin into a canvas. Um, but it, it's quite interesting that actually across all cultures, having 
a healthy skin is considered an attractive feature. So whatever we do to our skin, it is actually considered if you've got healthy skin, that that is an attractive thing. So you can understand the, the, the impact of skin conditions. So what else do we do with it? Well, maybe the good stuff. Um, so I, I think I would turn around and say, actually, we do protect our skin and we're going to spend a bit of time talking about skin protection and how, how we do that. Um, and we cherish our skin. So quite a lot of people look after their skin. I, I spend a lot of my time in clinic thinking that um, uh, the ladies do this a lot better than the men. Um, but when you start realising how much the beauty industry is worth, which is a mere 27 billion pounds, um, you, you tend to get into that situation where you, you know that we're, we're, we're spending money on it, we're, we're looking after it. So, so there's a, a sort of bit of a, a dichotomy here of two different things that are going on, a bit of abuse, but a bit of uh, cherishing as well. So how common are skin problems? How often are, are, are things coming up? Well, there are some pretty lively figures out there for, for, for people like me who are doing this job. So one in three of the population at any time have got a skin problem. And 13 million primary care consultations occur in the UK each year related to the skin. Which is actually particularly frightening because I then tried to work out how much one week of dermatology, which is what is currently provided on most medical student curriculums, then that's sort of I reckoned about one three hundredth, and yet you're probably doing, you know, uh, probably at least a tenth of your consultations in general practice are in in, in the skin. So so really really important to be aware of the the. Hey, perhaps we ought to be pushing that and we are trying to do that at uh, medical schools around the country. And what we're doing locally, well, actually, the, the UHD dermatology, we're, we're around about 10,000 visits, consult, surgery, phototherapy, all the different things that we do per year at UHD dermatology. Um, I felt that I almost needed to put a picture up of my team looking frazzled because of the fact that we're doing so much. But in fact, it, this is just from this morning. We had, a, we actually very importantly, as we're all getting together between being Bournemouth and Poole, uh, we're having a big UHD away day and we did that on a rather windy blustery beach so um, that was just to, to show a nice moment and all our big team and all the people that you might be seeing uh, in through the department. So common skin conditions there's sort of like a top five you're probably here already that I'm uh, into my football so you know like a top six in the Premier League there's a but there's a top five of, of skin conditions that we see um, and I'll sort of work through those a little bit um, hopefully those are very relevant to to people listening but also you know these are things particularly at the end there's got to be messages and uh, hopefully things that I can get across that are going to going to be useful so I'm going to start off with eczema um, which is phenomenally common uh, and the situation with that is something that we've, we've learned about and we talk a lot in dermatology about the skin barrier and looking after the skin barrier. So that is that your skin provides, as I said, the way of sort of avoiding toxic agents getting into the skin. But if you develop eczema, what happens is that skin barrier, that top surface of the skin that's keeping stuff out, just begins to break down and crack open. And you can think of common times that they did this. And of course, during COVID, um, I considered that the dermatology departments across the country probably did their most useful work by providing lots of moisturisers for the staff that were that, that were involved because we set up these hand dermatitis clinics because the, so many people were hand washing, hand gel, drying their hands out and that perturbs the skin barrier. It makes the skin barrier break down and then you get a situation where you set off some inflammation. So the chemicals are getting into the skin and you're setting off the inflammation. And once the inflammation is there, that increases the perturbation of the skin barrier. It makes it break up even more. And so other stuff getting on. So, so if you're recurrently washing your hands, even if you just put the water on your hands, when it's broken and split and cracked, you then will get the whole process continuing and, and, and becoming worse. So, so you, the, the question about stepping in.
What's interesting about the fact that I've just talked about the skin barrier is we've learned a lot of that from what's called atopic eczema. And atopic eczema, again, many of you will be aware of this, uh, is a uh, condition that tends to go along with asthma and hay fever and a certain genetic tendency. And what has been identified is that there is a cement which is involved in the building blocks of the skin. So on that top surface layer on the epidermis, you have this sort of cement around your epidermal cells. And people who have a tendency to atopic eczema ha will have less of a gene called filaggrin or they'll produce less of the filaggrin protein going round those skin cells. So their cement in between the bricks of the skin is less good. And so more easily things get in and so more easily they then get inflammatory responses to stuff that's going in onto the skin and there's then a sort of discussion about whether this sets off other immunological problems at a later point um and actually that's why i've put in where you, you're atopic dermatitis prevention so what you're then doing is you're actually preventing the that difficulty that you've got with the skin barrier by using a moisturiser onto the skin, that actually improves the barrier back again and reduces that inflammation, helps the whole condition to be settling down. So I do a children's clinic, so I run a children's clinic on a Tuesday afternoon at Christchurch. I, I, my, my children's nurse Odette will tell me that that's the place I smile the most. I think I'd hope that that is the case. I do enjoy doing the children's clinic, but a phenomenally common situation is the atopic eczema in children. and and the reason behind that, one in five children. So children just seem to have a drier skin that the barrier of the skin breaks down more easily. So one in five under seven will have eczema. And often it links in with family history. So you'll often ask mum and dad and they'll have hay fever or asthma or other conditions like that. And that may be that there's that genetic tendency towards this dryness of the skin that we need to manage to try and improve the eczema that, that children are suffering with. Over and over again, we get asked, what is she or he allergic to? And I think I try and get the point across that actually atopic eczema in, in children, for most children, they do not need allergy tests. This is a tendency to dry skin that is inherited and part of childhood. And so there will be, you know, the, the coming and going of intermittently inflamed skin and it may be at the far end of the spectrum it, the severe version or it may be of a more mild just in the folds of the skin so very different in different people but i would comment that most children do not need allergy tests there is a caveat to that because children with severe eczema often do have food allergy and we will say if children come along to us and they've got severe eczema and that'll be the group of patients that we'll see they often if they've got gut upset or they've got constipation or mum says they're having to change the nappy loads of times a day those are gastrointestinal effects that may well be linked with some allergy problem particularly cow's milk protein allergy which is a common thing i'm not going to talk about it much but it, it just being aware to that is but for most children we don't need allergy tests and the nice guidelines on atopic eczema tell us that you can as long as you can get the situation better with children with standard and effective treatment you again don't need to be going searching for allergy tests so what i try and get my parents get involved with is actually learning about all the different moisturizers using the moisturizers regularly um, so the emollients of moisturizers can be yeah that's a sort of interchangeable term that i use um, i've got a few pictures there some other things that we, we might try when the skin is inflamed, though, you need something anti-inflammatory. So you're going to need something that suppresses that redness and soreness on the skin. And once you suppress the redness and the soreness, then you can allow the barrier to be improved again with the moisturiser applications. And avoiding soap. So we know that children that are give you the using soap, so, you, you know, early on in life, if children are exposed to the baby washes with a lot of soap or shampoos and other stuff like that, then it perturbs the skin barrier and the skin barrier in children is more sensitive to that. So we ask parents to use soap substitutes. There's less bath oil prescriptions happening currently, but more of the moisturizers and those sorts of things. You can just pump the moisturizer into the bath and use it as a soap substitute. 
Now, I've commented about anti-inflammatory treatment and trying to suppress the inflammation. And I think this is an area where we often get concerns from parents, but also from adults as well about using steroids. And so steroids have a sort of difficult connotation, don't they? Because people think that they're going to be, you know, using the stuff that that bodybuilders are injecting to make their muscles bigger. They are natural body hormones that we are using and they are in a medical form and they applied onto the skin. I've put ointments rather than creams because the ointments tend to work better, but either can be used. And we have a grading system to allow us to know which level of topical steroids to be using. So again, I talked to the GPs about this. You're starting off with a lower level, like a 1% hydrocortisone and stepping up using the level that you need to use. But we know if you swiftly suppress the inflammation and make the skin barrier better again, then you, you're going to need less in the long term. So actually that idea of suppressing quickly and getting eczema controlled and then utilising the moisturisers alongside to keep the whole condition better is actually better than trying small amounts of lower strength and not really getting the, the improvement that you want. The other thing related to safety of these treatments is about the amount that you use. So, so the tubes, and I've got some examples there, and you've got a sort of 100 gram tube that, that, that's there, um, the bigger tube. And if we actually check to see how much an adult with eczema all over their legs needs, if you give them a 30 gram tube, or we use this from GP practice or I use it, it's going to be there for five days. Well, nobody can get back to their GP again in five days. So actually, it's really important to give big prescriptions of it and make sure that you're asking for those who are using reasonable amounts of topical steroid onto the skin. A three year old child, for example, with eczema all over will need it'll only last them two days with that prescription. So getting them back into uh, the practice in two days is just not sensible. We need to be just making sure that enough prescriptions are going on. So practical use of topical corticosteroids and, and, and you know, these are safe and using them in the, at the right level in the right place. So somewhere like an eyelid might be a difficult area to think about because it's a thin bit of the skin, but using the lower potency, using the ointment so that you can just see them greasy on the skin is the correct level to be using topical steroids. And that will then suppress the inflammation, which then in combination with the emollients will allow you to be in a situation where there'll be improvement of the skin condition. We tend to use steroids once a day now. There was previously a tendency to use them twice a day. I think when things are severe, I get my patients using it twice a day, but normally we're just on a once a day use. Um, and nighttime seems a sensible time to be doing that because it stays on the skin and, and, and will work through. Uh, a common question that gets asked about should I use my steroid before my moisturizer or the other way round? Uh, sadly, you get different answers from different people. And I, I'll sort of qualify that because I would tend to say so the neat topical steroid onto the skin, putting it on when there's nothing else on there is the way of getting the maximum benefit from it, um, using it, giving it at least 30 minutes to sink in and for the actual treatments to be able to um, be in onto the skin is, is going to allow the inflammation to settle. Um, but we do sometimes utilize the moisturizer first because particularly with children, you get less stinging. So sometimes the steroids will sting, which they won't do if you put the moisturizer on first. And then it's how long do you use it? And again, it's that point about using the treatments safely, running the treatments for a period of time. I will often say you need to be using it for patients that see me with bad eczema. We will say four to six weeks nightly, getting it all under control, using it until it's better. But my better and your better are probably different. And if there's a parents listening who, who've been in clinic with me, they know I say that to them because I would wait until the barrier is right the way back to normal and then so that, and then come off the steroid. And you may even consider doing gradual withdrawal. So it might be that you'd use it every other day uh, and then reducing down to twice a week. And there's some good data about there managing eczema with using twice a week steroid. You may end up using less steroid using it twice a week than if you wait until the skin gets bad. So that idea of stepping in early and treating things quickly is often what we will recommend. So some other nice questions, which moisturizer should I use? Which which one which one's the best? Well, that that's such an easy question because it's the one that you use. 
okay and all of our skins are different there are lots of different skin types and so that challenge one thing may not suit one person and will suit another one so it is all about giving people having the opportunity to use moisturizers that they get on with and they can use and yes there are some that are standardly prescribed because they are the more resource sensible so i'd say cheaper alternatives and they do work but if you don't get on with them we should be considering other ones particularly if you've got skin conditions and many of my patients will have ones that they like to use and they're allowed to get that from the gp we have agreements on formulary to say that you can have the the moisturizer that you get on with you can't have all of them because you can't get the you know super expensive ones but there are a, a list of moisturizers that we can use on our formulary which we regularly review Throw in a little comment about aqueous cream because I think it used to be used quite a lot as a moisturizer and actually it's worthwhile thinking about olive oil as well because a lot of people talk about using olive oil on the skin I know pregnant mums and so on use it but actually there is some evidence to say both aqueous cream and olive oil can perturb the skin barrier and actually rather than moisturizing it can actually produce more, more trouble we do use aqueous cream as a wash but not generally as a leave-on moisturizer And then there's the patients that see me. So, so the sort of severe end of the spectrum. So very severe atopic eczema is so life impacting. And, 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 you know, often what happens is the younger children will go through the phase. They will get better, which is great. But some of the more severe children will continue to come along to the clinic. We'll see them. We'll need to consider, try and get as much control as we can. But we know that it affects sleep and mood and education and work and relationships so loads of impacts from it and what we're also getting now is the science catching up with the immunological cause and i'll, I'll, I'll come on to this a little bit with, with with other conditions as well but what we used to do maybe or some of the science coming through is the idea of because it's an exacerbated immune response in the skin we know that if we suppress the immune response we can actually be in a situation where those areas of inflammation will settle down. So if you take steroids by mouth, the inflammation will settle, but you can't use that as a long term treatment. So we were using other what we call steroid sparing agents. But as time has gone on, we've become much better at targeting and knowing which particular molecules are the molecules which produce particularly the severe end of the atopic eczema spectrum. And so we have biological agents so there's a biological agent called tupilumab which we use for the skin which is an anti-interleukin-4 and that targets the specific bit of the immune system that's producing eczema problems and utilizing that um i love making this comment from the uh, a, a patient that i've seen relatively recently who just came back to me and said I've, I've got my life back. I've just, you know, this is this is so much better. And and, and he tried lots of other treatments uh, and he, he just felt that this was by far the best he had been. So it's nice to see that there is the technology. You feel bad because he's had many years where his skin has been much less well controlled. And now he's in a situation where he's got the improvement. So there's lots of resources. I'm going to be again, the resource slide will keep coming up. I'm, I've got the, the sort of National Eczema Society, the British Association of Dermatologists with this. Uh, our, our tagline about healthy skin for all is something that you know, provides as a patient hub there with lots of information available to, uh, about eczema and, and, and skin conditions. So uh, please head on to that and the NHS websites are good as well. OK, so keep you moving on. And again, it, I, I sort of feel like I'm in a children's clinic really here because actually I know the younger children come with eczema and then I get my teenagers. And so the, the teenagers come with acne. Um, we do use the term acne vulgaris a lot, which I've, I feel a bit worried about because actually vulgaris just means common and it's just us using a bit of fancy language. But sometimes I think it makes people feel that it's a bit vulgar and a bad thing. But I, that is a, a standard term that we use. Um, Amazingly, and the, some of this data that you get, 95% of 11 to 30 year olds have acne to some extent. And I, 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 you know, sit with that. You know, you do, even, even as you get older and older, and I know full well, you get the occasional pimple and you think, oh gosh, you know, there's still that memory of those, those, those difficult times when the skin was more active. But we do know that teenage time is, is the problem. And what that links in with is that the sebaceous glands, the grease glands in the skin are much more sensitive to the hormones at that stage. And, and, and your hormonal profile and things, go, you, your hormones going up and down, particularly male hormone levels, but also with 
menstruation and other changes, you, you, you will then the grease glands will be sensitive to that. Um, and the grease glands then block up the pores block and you then get the blackheads and the whiteheads, which, which all of us are, are pretty aware to and, and, and seeing these types of problems. Um, and it can then step on. So once you've got the blackheads and the whiteheads and then and, and the acne bacteria start to multiply and there is a, a tendency to then pick up inflammation and, and, and many of you will have come across people and, and, and know about this type of situation where people then develop pain and cysts and some scarring, which is really something we're keen to avoid. So I'll come on to that in a bit. There are lots and lots of different skin types. So this is a, going back again to your mo moisturizers suit you. So it is tricky. You know, some people are more acne prone, have that type of skin. And it's important to think about that when you're spending all your money that I've just talked about in the cosmetics and, and, and picking the right ones. There are what's called non comedogenic moisturizers. So there are moisturizers that don't produce blackheads. So they've tested to, to improve, make it less likely to be a problem on acne containing skin. So it is that idea of getting used to and knowing what sort of things suit your skin. But there are a lot of over the counter treatments for acne. Um, and I remember as a, when I was training, I, I, I was quite struck by a medical student who came to see me with acne and he didn't he didn't want to take any tablets, but he was very, very keen to make sure he used topical treatment. And he really did improve considerably with the right topical treatment. And I think, it, again, it's where people, oh, it's just a cream. It's not going to it's not really going to do the job. But actually, we do find when used correctly and, and the right type of creams that you do get the benefit that you want. We're often asked about diet, so everyone says, well, you know, is it because I'm eating too much sugar or stuff like that? And the answer is probably not. We don't think diet has a major impact in acne. If you have lots and lots of refined sugar, there may be a situation where that's possible. If you're drinking pints and pints of milk, because there's some discussion about that. But in general, we do not think diet is relevant. So I, I, that, that usually, unfortunately, they get the difficulty with the parents going, well, it's because of what you're eating. And actually, we're saying, no, 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 it's nothing to do with that. So the next sort of steps on obviously the self-management side to, to acne and there are lots of things out there and getting advice from pharmacists and so on is, is, is an option. Um, but the GPs can prescribe effective acne treatment and, and in certain situations that is the right thing to do. Like I've said, the topical therapies, we try and aim those into the, the, the type of acne that you've got. So if you've got more blackheads, we'd go for something that lifts blackheads, more whiteheads, you might go for more of an antibiotic type one. So there's a different types of topical treatment that are available. Um, and then the next step on and, and, and thinking about acne treatment, we tend to use oral antibiotics for a three month course. We don't usually use the antibiotics that we'd, you, you would use for short bursts for other conditions and we're offering the tetracycline antibiotics, other antibiotics like that. But I always, and I hope it chimes with people, is if you're going to have something from inside, have something from outside as well in that setting. So where you've got the Ori antibiotics, use it with the topical treatment that your GP is pres prescribing. Make sure that you've got something from inside, something from outside. And for women, the, the, the combined contraceptive pill can level out hormones and improve acne. But you get into difficult situations. And, 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 and again, this is the, 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 the type of thing that we like to get patients early who are getting the nodular scarring acne. So, so, so we ask, we say, if you're getting the scarring and the nodules, we can do something about this. And so, so, so we feel that's a really important point to say, if you've got the scars, you've got the nodules, if antibiotics aren't sorting it out, now that may give you a bit more time, but if it's not improving it, then again, we we're here as dermatologists with options to treat acne. Um, and also, we, we, you can't underestimate the psychological impact, people's confidence being knocked. You know, it's difficult to go to work with a spot even when you're 50. And so, so that psychological impact is, is a big and important point that we need to, to get across, which is very important in teenage years as well. So if the skin condition is having a psychological impact, then there are options for treatment. And in general, we're using this drug called isotretinoin and, and, and isotretinoin is 
potentially uh, a, a, just a different drug. So it just works completely differently to all the treatments that we have. Uh, it works by shrinking the grease glands in the skin. So where I just talked about that abnormality, the sensitivity of the grease glands to the uh, hormonal milieu, then making the acne happen, you shrink all the sebaceous glands so they're no more active and they don't pick up, that the, they don't continue to block and that sort of stuff. It's controversial because of the side effect and we'd love to have Roaccutane without side effects or isotretinoin is the, the proper name without side effects, but that there because of the way the drug works and its penetration into the grease glands, it actually has does have to penetrate other areas and it affects you get dry lips and dry skin. Um, completely contraindicated in pregnancy and something that we have to get people to sign and say that they, they're completely understanding that they must be avoiding that. And then there's a discussion about mood disturbance. And, and I just made the point that if you're very upset about your skin, so if someone comes to me and says, I'm not going to school because of my acne, I will strongly consider putting them on the isotretinoin therapy. But in the side effects and the discussions and online and, and, and lots of other forums about isotretinoin, there are these concerns about mood. What we tend to say is actually, if you ask a big bank of people on this treatment who've got bad acne and you say to them, how's your mood? Many of them will say, I'm happier because my skin's getting better. And it's so important to just think of that balance between those things. But there have been significant problems with mood, so we do have to balance it out. But it is curative in 75%. So seven to eight out of 10 people who take it only ever need to take it one time and then their acne will settle down. Their skin changes to a more sort of soft skin, we find, and that is exceptionally effective. And it takes two years for the grease glands to grow back. And so you're then in a situation where we've sorted out the acne problem. And once again, there's good support out there. And I think, again, you know, with the teenagers and getting the understanding, going to the right websites to, to find out about acne and having the correct um, uh, information uh, is absolutely vital. So please push people onto the right areas of things because we know there's lots of forums and so on and areas where perhaps there's an exaggeration of side effects and difficulties. And, and I often say, if you're fed up about your skin, you'll go on and talk about it on the online. But actually, if you're happy you're busy going off and doing other stuff you don't sit on the, online and talk about it so we're into infections now which is in the in, in the top 10 when we're sort of move, moving down the top 10 um and i i just sort of reflected on this really the fact that it actually it, it must be nicer to be a, a a doctor now than in the uh what, what would have been sort of you know the 18th century europe uh where, where the masks that the um, dermatology wasn't around then, but the physicians had to wear to, to deal with bubonic plague were, were, were pretty horrific. And, and what's quite interesting is actually they, it was believed that the mask actually did make impact in reducing down the transmission of bubonic plague. Uh, and what they also did was they put herbs in the end of the mask. I don't know whether that was just to mask the smell of the... 18th and 17th century Europe, but I think it was also a situation where they thought that the herbs would actually reduce down the number of vapors coming in and giving you the you know, making you less likely to get um, a bubonic plague. So, so quite nice, but in a way, infection is one of those things where actually we've we've had to learn to change and things are moving on. And it in dermatology, we've we've got over 2,000 diagnoses, and although there are common ones are common, which I've just we're sort of going through. You've got to be aware of all the different infections and other things that can occur to the skin and how we manage those. Um, and it's evolving and 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 uh, the difficult stuff about mentioning the current pandemic and the fact that the first ever WhatsApp disease came from dermatology because uh, Italian children were getting dusky toes. And they were getting dusky toes, but they weren't unwell. So the children during the COVID outbreak in early phases were all, and so they're all reporting in amongst parents all going, well, why have you, has your kid got dusky toes as well? Yeah, I've got dusky toes. So we learned about COVID toes from the information that we were getting from parents. And that, and, and, and as I said, this was, this was described in the medical literature as the world's first WhatsApp disease. So, so you have to keep up with all social media doing dermatology. 
And skin infections can occur, so you can't just get direct infection of the skin. So there are certain situations where you, you, you'll, the sign showing on the skin is related to the infection itself. You know, many of us will have this type of situation where we go on a hot holiday and don't have enough sun cream on your lips and you develop a cold sore or you get unwell and you develop a cold sore, you're stressed, you get a cold sore. So, so there are common things that are common. There are ways around that reduce down your stress maybe, making sure you're looking after yourself, putting on plenty of sun cream on your lips when you're going away on holiday, all those sorts of things. But in typical fashion, I talk about also that the different infections will be different in different people. So in fact, in children, you can get a very severe herpetic gingerostomatitis the first time you get it. And then unfortunately that then lives back in the nerves and then comes back out again when there's stresses and other things. And it is a phenomenally common skin infection, um, but perhaps some ways around it, but that's often the first, first thing that happens. And I think while I was talking, while I was saying, you know, one in three people and, you know, during this talk will have a skin problem. Um, I think the, the itchy between the toes is, you know, something that probably everybody's experienced at some time in life. So this is a sort of a fungal infection in between the toes. There are treatments that we use and these are, you know, looking after your skin, stepping in with treatment, getting it better. Um, and once again, in typical dermatology fashion, I'm able to find a, a, a situation that we'd come across where a patient had been utilising the topical steroids which is the wrong treatment because they suppress inflammation and this is infection. So infection just makes hay when you put topical steroids on it. So it is an important thing to be making sure you're using the right treatment. So what was happening is that this patient had less itching between the toes, but the red rash just spreads up and you've got toenail involvement and so on. So uh, uh, sorry about the insensitive pictures. I don't think we mentioned that at the start. We should have said there may be a few insensitive pictures. So <laughs> apologies for the feet at, uh, uh, on a Thursday evening. Now, uh, uh, infections, common infections, uh, things that we see that we know about, but things we really would like people to self-manage rather than be in a situation where you're coming into hospital, except in certain circumstances. So viral warts. Um, what, what's interesting is that when NICE did a review of the best possible evidence for treatment of viral warts and verrucas and finger warts, all those sort of things, so verrucas are the same thing, it's the application of salicylic acid, which just reduces down the top layer from the skin. And then you need to pare the skin down to using your salicylic acid. You're letting that dry onto the skin and then you're paring down each day to get so that you take away that bigger layer over the top of the, the wart. And my patients, will, will, they'll, they'll, they'll know, we'll hear about this situation where you have a um, I've got a child in the background, sorry. Uh, the the um so so something like uh, I talk about a big bunch of keys. So so your immune system is always looking at warts, and so people will clear warts of their own accord with time. But I say you've got a bunch of a hundred keys. Some people are lucky and it's a single key, job done. Some people are very unlucky and they have to wait till the hundredth key to then open the door and the warts disappear. So 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 that type of thing happening. Um from a science point of view, warts are particularly difficult because there are so many myths around them because they do go of their own accord. So people talk about, you know, burying some bacon in the back garden and going around a tree anti-clockwise three times. That probably isn't scientifically based. Um, but because when people's warts go away, it may have happened the same time. And so uh, you get myths associated with it. Um, but then there's the difficulty of the, the, the maybe immunosuppression or other reasons that may make people have problems that, you know, the, 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 you're then life impacting, it's movement impacting, et cetera. And so we then consider some of the treatments that we may have, the destructive therapies and so on that we might utilize um, and therapies that actually bring that immune system. So where, where, where the keys just aren't opening the door to the immune system to clear your warts, you get an idea of actually bringing the immune system to the skin and that may be an effective way of, of eradicating warts. The other thing with infection is you get a situation where you have an internal infection, but your skin shows that. And so you have a reaction in the skin 
and it would be remiss of me to talk as a dermatologist at, about skin infection without mentioning something like this, which people will recognise as being the, the vasculitis non-blanching rash that you rub your glass over and it doesn't disappear. So it's the non-blanching purpuric eruption that relates to meningococcal septicemia and some other causes of septicemia. So this is these are the rashes that you need to be attending your doctor quickly, particularly if you're sick with anything else, because these can be signs of sepsis. And, and I work over at Bournemouth Hospital as well, going around seeing acute cases. And so this is a very common situation that you get infections um, showing themselves in the skin. So, so this patient with an erythema multiforme on the hands is a condition we've seen with, with, with chest infection, a mycoplasma infection. Uh, and uh, so, so the skin's manifesting. It's not the actual infection on the skin itself. It's that the body's infected and the skin's showing the signs of it. So we have to be switched on and be able to diagnose what types of problem we're dealing with. So moving on through the top common skin conditions and I, thanks to a patient that I have who who drew this for us to just tell us what life's like with with, with, with skin conditions and, and it, it just does illustrate brilliantly the situation that 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 people are in and so in trying to understand and and we've got you know, bandages, dressings, antihistamines, lots of different treatments, uh, the patches all over the skin in different places, uh, dry, itchy, all looks a bit different in different places, clothing difficulties, and then the big help. And this links in, with, in fact, in, with psoriasis in this particular issue, although eczema, there may be the same, so maybe even some of the sort of fold over between those conditions. So, but psoriasis in a very typical way uh, is what we call an organ specific autoimmune disease. So people know the autoimmune diseases like type 2 diabetes, like uh, autoimmune thyroid disease. Um, in the skin, this is the one where, and so I talk about with patients about your blood and your skin sort of arguing with each other in a way. So the blood, the cells from the blood then going into the skin and causing inflammation. And the causes, there's lots of different causes behind this. Uh, there'll be the genetic tendency and the, it'll run through families, but it's not absolutely every one and it's different in each different people. So it's likely to be a number of different genes that play a role. Environment and most of my patients with psoriasis will describe that when stress happens, their skin will get worse or a stressful event that's actually triggered it off. Sometimes see it with some of the medications as well. So other reasons that psoriasis can can come on and be a problem. And it does link in as well. So psoriasis is more of a generalized condition. And I've got a, a colleague here who uh, Dr. Mukherjee, who runs a uh, rheumatology clinic with patients with psoriasis as well so we work together to organizing so that we ensure that we're doing the best treatments that for, for conditions where cover and people often have nail disease if they have the the joint involvement as well so that's something that we do see coming together treatment wise similar to eczema i talk about individualizing therapy because actually the condition itself seems to be very individual um i there are newer treatments now so this is a situation where i'm further down my slide i've got this comment about tar based treatments and those of us that have been in dermatology for long enough all know that actually you if you go onto a dermatology ward it used to all just smell of tar where people were having their topical tar treatments to manage the psoriasis and it is a very effective treatment but it's just not effective use of resources to keep bringing people in to treat that way when you there are newer technologies uh, i've put this foam stuff Enstelar, up in the far corner as this being the one of the better treatments that we've got uh, and utilize a once a day treatment. It's a mixture between a steroid and, and a vitamin D. And these are treatments that the GPs can prescribe. So during periods that the skin is getting worse, you can have the treatment from your GP, get things under control. 
the moisturizers and the soap substitutes to control the itching and the irritation and other stuff that's happening and the scaling on the skin associated with psoriasis all really important to utilize that because the condition will wax and wane so there'll be periods where it's better and periods where it's worse and so having a a way of treating it is exceptionally important but your gp can manage those sorts of things and there may be some self-management once you know how to do it you can then ask for the right things keep your treatment working but what about us as a dermatology department so so we're probably quite well known for the situation where we put people into um, one of my patients used to call it the Doctor Who box. So this is a stand up. This is a phototherapy. So it's a stand up UV light chamber and you go in with the skin condition. You gradually build through the treatments. You go twice a week, three times a week coming along to the department, gradually building up through an exposure of UV onto your skin. Uh, and this would be expected to lead to clearance in many people with psoriasis. So actually that, that bad flare can be controlled. Uh, and it's a situation where we often recommend that you can repeat the treatments. Yes, you're getting UV on the skin. And yes, there is some issue with that, which over a long, long period may be more problematic, but it is a very helpful treatment and we, we are available for that and, and, and able to sort that through. Then there's the blinding with science, sorry, but the, 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 so, so the complexity of the human immune system is started to be being picked apart. And once again, much like eczema, in psoriasis, we know if you suppress the immune system and you can do that in quite a blanket way, you can then improve psoriasis. But actually, they then get other side effects associated with suppressing the immune system. So we've began, begun to pick up the targeted treatments. And all the way back 25 years ago or 20 years ago, when I was training, we've started to get these biologic treatments. And it was incredible how people who hadn't been coming to the hospital for years and years would come to the hospital for their it biologic infusion because they suddenly realized that there was a treatment there that was very, very effective. And so we started to see much more targeted, helpful treatments, potentially less side effects, although there are side effects with them. But these sort of molecules that then pick off bits of the immune system, which are the bits for particular activating psoriasis, different individuals will have different probable triggers and so it may be that different treatments will suit different people sadly we're not a situation yet where we can just take blood tests and go oh you'll be do best with this medication we'd love to be in that situation we're not quite there yet and i talked about again about the resources for the different skin conditions um i quite like the so teen website which is from the psoriasis association and so the the, the teenagers and, and 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 they quite like it it's a bit like a science lesson really they they go through they realize they understand as to as why they're getting the skin condition and and the active management that they can do and things that they can do to look after themselves on that so down into the southwest and the, the absolutely no doubts that I can't do a skin talk without talking about skin cancer. Um, and this is data related to melanoma um, and the maps are showing the red hot places and the places where melanoma is most of a problem. And here we are down here and very clearly a problem, but actually the numbers of melanomas compared to the 1970s, we're up 150 odd percent from where we were in the, the 70s. So it is very clearly an increasing problem with skin cancer. Um, melanoma is the second most common skin cancer in, in, in the younger age group as well. It is a very rapidly increasing cancer. There are more treatments than there were before, but there are still a situation where late presentations cause problems so 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 being aware to that so stepping on a little bit about how to look after your skin um sorry about the gratuitous amount of skin in this photo but it, it it's such a good illustration because skin types and different skin types in the sun it, sunbathing is is sun it is dangerous behavior okay so we would turn around and say you should not be sunbathing because that is at risk behavior that is basically just making damage to your skin but it's incredible when you've got three different people with different skin types the the 
poor young lady who's got the very fair skin, she's just going to go red. She's not even going to tan. So it's like, it really isn't the right thing for her to be doing. And, and, and it isn't right for any of them, but, but it's going to be even. She's going to even more quickly run into trouble and more quickly develop problems. So, so, so avoiding that. Sunbeds. So we talk about sunbeds and, and, and sunbeds give you quite a wide spectrum of UV. So although I've just talked about a therapeutic version of using UV light to treat psoriasis, we do not recommend sunbeds and we would like to see them moved out of all the places that they shouldn't be and all the 18 age groups and so on that have been brought in now to, to avoid the exposure that had been happening previously. Um, it, you know, we just say sunbeds again at risk behaviour, don't do it. So looking after your skin and people will know these sort of Aussie slogans of the slip slap slop um, that back in the 80s that they pushed in in in, in Australia and um, some of the hats that fit with that uh, seeking shade uh, and obviously slopping on the sunscreen. So that side of things with the sunscreen and thinking that through, it's quite interesting that in 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 Australia, they consider sunscreen as a medication and so they actually have a higher level of um, it's sort of uh, scientific background around their SPF 30s and making sure that their the levels stay after sports and other stuff like that. So actually, often they are the better sunscreens to use. An important point, though, you, you, you so the SPF 30 means that you can stay in the sun for 30 times longer than if you had nothing on before burning. But it's a bit tricky because actually, how thick should you put it on? Because in the test, they put it on at about one millimeter thick. And also how often because it washes off and that sort of thing. So regular application is important and you shouldn't burn. <laughs> OK, so that business about red skin and I'll come on to in a sec is, is something that is damaged to the skin. So is important to avoid. You've also got UVA ratings, which tend to be a little bit more of a European type of thing. But some of the sunscreens at one point had less good UVA, but good UVB. So you didn't burn, but you the UVA tends to then cause some of the long term uh, damage and the wrinkling, which people want to avoid. Uh, and, and so you're by reducing that UVA, you're probably reducing other skin cancer types um, and preventing wrinkles and so on. So the UVA reduction is really important. Continuing on with the sun safety message, you know, if you actually worked out what was going on with the skin of this person who's got red skin, when the UV goes onto the skin, the DNA takes up the UV and is damaged. And remember, DNA damage is what produces cancer. So what's happening here is that the redness on the skin is because the skin has is fighting off getting rid of all those damaged cells. And that is the, the inflammation of sunburn. So you have damaged the DNA of your skin when you have got sunburn. So, so that's vitally important to avoid that. And there are certain times of day. And the effects last. And, and, and so, so the situation where, you know, we know in, in people in the armed forces who have a lot of exposure and, and, and you know, doing incredibly important jobs. But we know that that may then continue on because you've exposed and then you get the cumulative effect of the, the, the UV and you don't develop the problems until you're in your 70s and 80s. So a very difficult situation for people to think, well, I won't worry about it now. But actually, it becomes very difficult at a later point and probably more relevant to now. I, I always wondered if this chap was roofing over at Christchurch, actually. But, it, you know, it, on top of a roof, top off, uh, getting sun exposure and, and, and certain jobs, there are much higher incidences of skin cancer and the importance of just doing the sun protection you must remember about. So. A little run through maybe about how to be a mole watcher, how to be looking out for things and trying to decide what you need to present with, what you don't need to present with. So we tend to divide it up into pigmented lesions and non-pigmented lesions. So this one's a lovely hairy mole. OK, you, you people don't like the hairs in their moles. We like it a lot because moles with hairs on them are almost never melanoma. So that's a, a, a nice sign. Um, you can get melanoma in hair bearing skin, so slightly tricky, but but basically the hairs are something that you don't like, but we do. Uh, and then there's non-pigmented lesions, and I'll come on to those a bit. That's a basal cell carcinoma on a chap's ear. I did have one patient who had his ear chewed by his cockatiel, and he sat and chewed and chewed and chewed, and he got trauma with sun exposure, and he got a basal cell carcinoma on his ear. I think that might be that picture. 
So what are we looking out for? So we have an A, B, C, D, E rule for managing pigmented lesions in the skin. The A is asymmetry, so looking out for things that you can't fold over. So you may have a, an area that just you can see the nice round, regular, slightly hairy mole, which I'm going to be very comfortable and know full well is benign. And then you've got this item here, which is on the skin, which you just you've got a different pattern in different places and it's fitting to the rules of the asymmetry. So there's no way you can fold that over and think that that's the same on either side. Then the border. And so things with an irregular border and you know, scalloped border and changing and it, all these things are sort of concerning features for, for a melanoma. Colour. So the C stands for colour and you've got, I tend to say, say to people, if it's two colours, you'd be a bit worried. Three colours, you need to be seeing someone. So, so different pigmented lesions can look different. The experts get involved and sort that out. But those, those colour changes and a number of different colours here, you've got a sort of grey and dark brown and light brown and Maybe a little bit subtle on that, but it's definitely something you've got to be watching out for. Diameter I talk about as being greater than the greater than the blunt end of a pencil, so greater than six millimeters. So if you can cover your mole with a blunt end of a pencil, it probably is OK, although melanomas do start somewhere. So if you suddenly can't cover it, then it may be because of the uh, mole is changing and evolving. Uh, and so we put in that ABCDE, which is the evolution part to it and making sure that we know that you're, you're dealing with things when they're changing and growing. And that's another melanoma. So we've had a, about five melanomas all, all related to the, these different characteristics that we'd like people to look out for. The ugly duckling sign. So, so if you've got something that stands out compared to the rest of your skin, uh, this one here, lots and lots of moles, but clearly there's something here that we need to be looking at. We've got one on the back of the leg there as well. So really, really important to pick out the thing that just doesn't look like any of your other skin lesions and then onto the non-melanoma so thinking about the ones that aren't the pigmented aren't the brown lesions it's about things that are growing and changing and breaking the skin down and that will happen you know skin cancer doesn't shrink you get a gradual increase in size of these lesions to to mean that you know that you need to be presenting those to your gp when it's growing it bleeds your bleeding is because it's outgrown its blood supply and bits die off and you get little vessels moving around and also new lesions so things that are appearing new in and actually you shouldn't be getting new moles after around the age of 40 to 50 so actually that'd be a situation where you'd be more worried about a new lesion uh, and important to check in on those and I tend to talk about the six week rule so if you've got something on your skin it's been there for a six week period it's non-healing then important to, to present that to your GP. OK, I'm sorry, that's maybe gone on a bit longer than I expected it to, but thank you very much. I think that that's about sort of cherishing your skin, looking after your skin and there's it's sort of simple stuff, really. I, I, actually, your general health, you're looking after yourself, eating the right things, doing things. These are all really, really important to actually looking after your skin and because that that is the way that you ensure that your skin stays healthy. Talking about maybe stepping in early, so our COVID clinics and getting your moisturisers on your hands to prevent your, your, your dryness. That's really important. The earlier you treat, you're less likely to develop problems. Um, I'm going to want everybody to be sun safe and the idea of self checks, hopefully from today, you got a bit of an idea about what you're looking out for. There are lots of websites out uh, with the information and what to look out for for moles and, uh, and deal with those. And perhaps we're here if you need us, so, so that's set up and uh, my final slide is really just saying, please enjoy the sunshine in the uh, in the best way that you can uh, at the moment that you want to be doing it. So uh, a nice sunset <laughs> that's disappeared. OK, thanks very much, James. Uh, and thank you very much, Dr Pearson. That was in incredibly informative. Um, and uh, I, I was intrigued to hear about burying bacon. Um, um, I've never <laughs> heard that in a health talk, so that was brilliant. And um, we've actually had some questions in, so if I if I can ask some questions, that would be brilliant. Sure. Uh, so let's go for the first question. Um, it's quite a long one, so bear with. Um, what is the best course of action to take when a patient presents with a skin mole that, although sustaining an unimpressive size of three to four millimetres, is growing outwards, protruding, over a couple of years from a flat mole. Should the patient see the GP and get the mole removed or is it safe to just watch it over the years? If the patient is prepared to have it removed privately, does the NHS have a list of reputable private clinics that GPs can recommend to patients? 
Thank you. So um, always difficult to comment on singular things, but moles that have been there for a long period of time and are not rapidly growing and changing would be a less concerning thing. But at any point that you're worried, then it is worthwhile getting a mole checked because the GPs have the skills they're looking at them in, and com compared to your other moles and that sort of stuff and make sure that we can be reassuring. The outward growth of a mole, often if it's in a very symmetrical pattern, would tend to be a, a, a bit less worrying. Um, from the point of view of wanting to have moles removed, there are many people do want to have moles removed and I would just say the importance of dermatology training and actually there are people so we get what's called a CCT so we've got our CCST the, the specialist training in dermatology and people who have the certificate of specialist training in dermatology would be someone that you could go and see and you could get the correct opinion about removing mold. I always worry about that situation where people go to uh, potentially someone who could willingly remove a mole but they're not actually looking at under the microscope correctly or they're not checking and they're not looking at the right things so so I, that would be my comment about all the the certificate of eligibility for the specialist training that we've all been through to make sure that we, we we can provide the right advice thank you very much for that um actually a question on 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 um um you showed a slide that talked about 2000 deaths from skin cancer can you explain how from a mole can go to, to to sort of to develop onwards so that actually the patient dies of skin cancer. Yeah, so so I do quite a lot of talks to GPs, which I hope comes across. And I I, I so so that idea that early on, so a melanoma that's less than a millimeter, you've got 98 out of 100 people will be absolutely fine if you catch it early and you remove it. It's surgically, it's gone, it's not going to spread internally. But what happens with melanoma, the cells, the melanoma cells are able to penetrate in into the blood vessels or lymphatics and then they can spread to other areas of the skin and so what or sorry other areas of the body. So so what then happens is you can get a widespread cancer from an initial mole that has been able to grow big enough, be left long enough to become invasive become inside and then you get what people describe as metastatic cancer so you've got other areas of involvement and, and and we have got a lot more treatments now for metastatic melanoma because it's quite sensitive to immune drugs but it is something that over the years I've, I've, I've seen over and over again people presenting late with their melanomas and they've spread inside and you then just get a big burden of cancer disease like like many of the cancers when they spread they become much more difficult to treat and take over and and and, and make it more difficult for people to, to stay well and and sorry there's one subsequent question on that sort of what what sort of time scales are you talking about how how how, how long um you know you've talked about people should present within six weeks type thing but obviously that's quite difficult at the moment how long should people sort of be looking at things for before they sort of get concerned i think we're changing moles it's it's, it's moving fast and, and and you know the nhs had said you know we're there for cancer management it's important for you to be able to get to your gp and show them the GPs will look at photos and there's some ability to look at photos of moles and say, you know, is that a worrying one? Do you need to come up? We've got special bits of equipment called dermatoscopes that we use to look at skin. Some of the GPs can do that as well. So there are actually ways of being, pay, people being able to present early. And I would I probably wouldn't stick with the six week rule. The six week rule is more about if something's on the skin, it's not healing because we all know you can get a mark or a bump and it'll just heal up or a burn and it'll just gradually heal up. So that's more for the non melanoma skin cancers when you're seeing moles that are changing and growing um, a new mole in a person who's over 30 ish. That would be something that you need to present early and quickly. Thank you very much. Now, there's always a question that I can't pronounce. So so and there's this is tonight is no exception. So bear with me. Could you provide me with some information about Pitarisis rosea? And not bad, not bad. Not bad, thank you, thank <laughs> you. Um, and possibly some helpful tips for management and how long it lasts. So pityriasis rosea, if that's the correct diagnosis, is, is, it, is a condition that is one of those ones, like I said, with the infections, you then get a reaction on the skin to internal infection. So it's usually some sort of viral infection or something that triggers it off, get red scaly changes in the skin. Often those do last, they can go up to about three months. 
So it can be a more extended course of treatment. Um, but it is inflammation on the skin. So you can use a similar treatment regime to the eczema type regime where you're using some steroids onto the skin, you're using the moisturizers, stopping using soap because that'll irritate the skin. So all of the things that I've talked about to try and improve skin um, would be relevant to a quite a big wide range of the uh, inflammatory skin diseases that we see. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And, and another question on on on. We know, and, and it's come across very clear. No one should have sunburn, so we don't want that. Um, but one of the questions that has come in is: Can any mole turn cancerous if it's on an area that has been sunburnt? Can the sort of sunburn actually sort of activate a mole into becoming cancerous, or, or does it not work like that? Um, a bit of a tricky one. It's more. It's actually more common to have a melanoma appear de novo on the skin as a melanoma than it is a mole to change. So that's a and that sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? So so those and so that's that single suddenly appearing growing pigmented lesion on the skin is actually more likely the melanoma. Um, the moles, yeah. I mean, if you've got a mole that's in an area that has been irradiated over and over again, that does increase the risk. But it's it so. Uh, the 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 numbers of de novo melanoma is higher than the uh, moles changing, uh, but we do ask people to look out for that because you do see, and it's uh, often the, there's the sort of flat freckle that suddenly starts to develop a lump in it. That would be one that you'd want to be presenting. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dr. Pearson. Uh, next question, uh, if I may: Are boys more likely than girls to have acne? And does a bad diet, I know you covered this, but just to stress, does a bad diet make it worse or does um, not sleeping correctly or not exercising or not taking fresh air? What sort of things does influence acne, if I may ask? Yeah, so uh, the answer about boys versus girls, I think boys have a tendency to have the more severe end of the spectrum, but actually the numbers are the, uh, are the same and we, we, we see a full spectrum through the, the 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 teenagers coming through the clinics um from the point of view of things that make it worse we always talk like i did on the very last slide about keeping yourself fit and healthy and drinking plenty of water and eating the right things and going out exercising and all those sorts of things do help and look after your skin not getting stressed but i think it's an important point that actually teenage life quite tough and it's particularly tough if you get acne as well. So actually, I would turn around and say, you know, concentrating on the things that you can do to improve that is is part of it. So listening to your teenagers and helping them with their treatment for acne, um, that will that will help. You know, even getting to the right websites, that sort of stuff as well. Um, so the the lifestyle factors are there, but they're not the whole story. And so it's important to think those lifestyle factors through and yes, reduce down their stress. But there's always seems to be exams when you're a teenager, aren't they? So it's hard times. But it's that question of then thinking how you work through that, getting the right advice and so on. And and yeah, doing as much as you can, but don't not not saying it's all going to get better because you stop eating chocolate. It's not true. Thank you. Uh, I think and I think a lot of teenagers will thank you as well for that advice. Um, uh, um, next question um, um, is something that, that that's um, um, uh, I know from my own family, what causes shingles and is it infectious? And I know what distress it causes as well. Delighted with that question because it's, I, I think I've tried to pin a professor of virology down about this and said, you know, it, so the answer is yes, there are virus particles in shingles in the blister fluid and therefore it is infectious to other people. But the problem is that the virus that causes shingles also causes chicken pox and so it will manifest different in different people so people won't get shingles but you have got the risk of chicken pox from shingles so we'd say when we're nursing patients in Bournemouth hospital with shingles we say don't have pregnant mums who haven't had chicken pox in the room because they that that then has the risk of getting them getting chicken pox so the answer is yes shingles is infectious but it's not going to give you shingles. It's it, 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 the, the two things are a, a, a different process. Um, but it is it, it, it as I said, it's a, I've talked to a professor of virology. It's quite a complicated area, particularly around vaccines and so on. Um, but yeah, that's that the, the two things are the same virus but manifest differently. Thank you very much indeed. Two more to go, um, if we may. Um, um, we've all done this. We've all rummaged in a drawer, grabbed some sunscreen when as soon as the sun comes out in in, in May or whenever. Um, 
Should we be buying sunscreens new every year? Does sunscreen go out of date? Yeah, so it does to a certain extent degrade. And yes, it is important to get a new one each summer and make sure that you're that you're using. You know, people will talk about which times of year do we need to be using. Um, but yeah, they, they do lose their benefit. Um, I, I feel particularly susceptible there on the basis. That I think usually I put the new ones on the kids and the old ones on me. But that it, I, I, think, I think we all live in the real world and you know what you what you can grab. But yeah, you should be getting new sunscreens because they will degrade and and, and no which year it's come from is always trickier than I always think as well so you, if you've got one that's five years old you're definitely in trouble whereas if you've got one that, that, that's newer and it's important about putting enough on you know if you're putting enough onto the skin you'll probably get through what you've got so that'll actually allow you to make sure that you're using enough. That's, that's very good advice and obviously um, um, hats as well I've seen you in, 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 in summer kit and, and uh, certainly a fan of a hat aren't you um, um, but it's important I think um, uh, one tip I know from my own family is they write the date in large letters of when they bought it so that you don't pick up one that's that's come from years ago and wonder where it's from. Um, um, last question, and thank you so much for this, Dr. Pearson. Um, the question, uh, should I request moisturiser instead of aqueous cream from my GP to use to keep it soft because of psoriasis? OK, uh, interesting one. I mean, I once again, I would turn around and say certain things will work in certain people and I think that's my view about it if if you're getting on with the treatment and it's working okay then use it these are safe treatments um my point was related to the aqueous cream a slightly tricky one but it, it, it may in some people particularly and maybe in children perturb the skin barrier a bit and there's some data about that so it may may be a less good leave-on treatment for eczema so it's just that concern that people just go straight for the aqueous cream because it was it used to be used a lot um but if it if, if it works well for you please use it because it's better to be doing that than start chopping and changing and finding things that don't work fantastic well, well it just befalls me now to say thank you so much for everyone who's joined us today and who's joined us on the recording in the future um but also a massive thank you to you uh, dr pearson if i can leave the last word with you if you had to say one bit of advice that we should all take from from tonight can you share it with us and then then we'll, we'll call it today and thank you again so much for joining us I don't think I'm doing one word. We've got to have we've got to have sun safety and we've got to be B mole watchers. I think those things, you know, and around here, I, I, it, it, I've I've it's very different to where we were in. I trained in London. I've come down to the southwest. I love it living down here, but it's so important because there's so much skin cancer. We've got to be switched on and getting things early and getting people treated to to sort it out. So, sorry, that was a terrible one word answer. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you all for joining us. Good night. Thanks.